The A album was defined by Ian Anderson's uh, exploration of certain electronic textures. But did Jethro Tull really end in 1979? It was once said that yes were Chris Squire and whoever else turned up. It seems Ian Anderson has ripped a page out of that book. There's no doubt that Anderson is the creative genius at the very centre of this band. Nobody would argue with that. Nevertheless, you know, to suggest I am Jethro Tull, does that not dismiss the contributions made by some fine, fine musicians that have undoubtedly coloured the, the, the musical palette that is this band, musical ideas that have been explored, the brilliance of somebody like Dee Palmer, whose sheer musicianship and arrangement skills have uh, certainly made an impact on that band, uh, not to mention the woody flutings of the portative pipe organ. Or what about the impact that Barrymore Barlow had? He really brought some uh, muscle to the Jethro Tull sound from 1972 onwards. The case is often made for Jethro Tull ending in 1979 or 1980, if you include the tour, was that uh, the A album just didn't sound like Jethro Tull. I would argue, of course, personnel aside, that Jethro Tull have always been a pretty eclectic bag. For example, Songs from the Wood sounds nothing like War Child or Too Old to Rock and Roll in the same way that A Passion Play sounds nothing like Aqualung or Stand Up. In the 1970s, of course, we've got Aqualung, that wheezy old soap dodger. Not to mention the conceptual brilliance that was thick as a brick or that, that meditation on the afterlife and damnation that was a passion play. And that's before we get rustic tull. And we also got the, um, the stillness of the gallery as well, which is an intriguing album that's a little bit out there, I think. So the argument for tull ending that after 1980, the music sounded untull-like it seems to be one that's seriously flawed if you look at this band's back catalogue, so we have to get back to personnel. It's that shifting of personnel that seems to have upset the Tull faithful. But this band have always been a, a carousel, really, uh, in terms of band members, with key band members as well. Let's not forget how seismic it was when Mick Abrams left after the first album, or uh, Glenn Cornick was fired and Clive Bunker was replaced by Barrymore Barlow. But I think the this lineup, there was something very magical, very magical and steady about this lineup from about uh, I think about seventy three onwards, all the way through the um, War Child, Two Old Rock and Roll Minstrel, and the Rustic period. But they began to really bed themselves in and establish themselves musically and tonally as part of the identity of this band. And it was Anderson's sacking of them, which left a very bitter taste in the the mouths of the, as I've said before, the Tull faithful with their clay pipes and feral sweaters. But I think Anderson insists that he didn't really sack them, it was just kind of a drifting away. Of course Barrymore Barlow uh, said he uh, resigned after the uh, being grief-stricken at the death of John Glasscock. But the rest of the band just uh, weren't brought back to the fold as Ian Anderson began to work on the A album, which was supposed to be a solo album, A for Anderson, but it was deemed far more marketable if it was a Jethro Tull record. So we've got a new incarnation of Jethro Tull by proxy, really. So in terms of personnel, when it comes to the A album, it was a new Tull broom sweeps clean. And uh, clean actually was a, a criticism aimed at this record. It was just too sterile, a bit untull like But it was, of course, Anderson exploring the musical landscape or the musical opportunities that presented themselves to him at this time. And why shouldn't he? But of course, then we get the Broadsword and the Beast, where Anderson hangs up the white boiler suit for a more minstrelly garb again, you know, and tights, uh, um, maybe other sort of gubbings going on there. But nevertheless, the sound was still a rockier sound, but one textured by the synth flourishes of uh, uh, Peter Vitesse, who did a wonderful job on that record, by the way. But nevertheless, it was an album that was with its use of mandolins and acoustic guitars, it was moving closer to what we identify as the classic Jethro Tull sound. Under Wraps is seen as a bit of a turd in the caviar, which I think is dreadfully unfair, because the writing on that album is brilliant, and the songs are brilliant. It just sounds polluted. And I hope Anderson uh, actually gets his way in re-recording the drums and replacing the drums on that record, and it would elevate this album, in my opinion, and I'm sure in the opinion of many Tull fans, 
who was probably still at home living with their mothers. But the Under Wraps album, yes, it's seen as a, a bit of a misguided step, shall we say. Now, interestingly, you get the Under... Uh, not the Under Wraps album, you get the Crest of a Nave album. By this time, Anderson has experienced some real vocal difficulties, and you can tell that um, Crest of a Nave has been recorded kind of down a step to help uh, accommodate his voice as it was then, but he, was still, he still sounded great as far as I'm concerned. And more importantly, the live performances were still fantastic. And I would argue you might disagree with me that uh, Crest of a Nave is in fact a quintessential Jethro Tull album. Um, Crest of a Nave is the quintessential Tull album, am I wrong? No, I think you're wrong. I mean, Crest of a Nave did well in the USA. <laughs> It starts to go off the boil after then. I don't think um, uh, Rocks, Rock Island, that's it, Rock Island, was uh, uh, tried to emulate the sound and vibe that we got on Crest of a Nave, but it wasn't quite there, really. I mean, Kissing Willie, less said about that, the better. But that album did include Strange Avenues, which is a great song, and Whaler's Dues. I mean, uh, I remember seeing them do that on the Rock Island. What a great song that was. But then that's when it start. That's really when Tull start to end for me. After that, they, of course, it was uh, Catfish Rising. To me, the last great Jethro Tull album was uh, Roots to Branches. After that, Anderson's voice, the deterioration in his voice was just too much, and not to mention the fact that uh, with age, he just could not put in the emulate that performance. That performance and the physicality of it was just not possible for him anymore. So from that point onwards, the Jethro Tull that I know and loved was just gone, really. So rather than 1979 marking the end of this band, I would say it's in fact more like sort of 1995. But I'd love to know what your opinion is on this. Please do click like, subscribe, check that notification bell, and check some of the links below this channel for ways you can support the sterling work done here at Classic Album Review. You can, uh, what can you do? You can become a Patreon, you can uh, make a donation to this channel so I can go and um, squander your money on um, silly, obscure, progressive rock items. I will leave you, leave you with my usual closing salvo, which is hope you're well, staying safe, and more importantly, that you keep listening. <laughs>